The University of Arizona and Intelligence Community Center for Academic Excellence presents a spotlight in the intelligence community. We welcome the Office of the Director of National Intelligence Representatives for our panel on language competency for the United States intelligence community. The Senior Language Advisor to the Director of National Intelligence, Mr. Don Gentile, is our keynote and will provide context for our panel discussion. Joining Mr. Gentile is Nazareth Berhane, who served as an FBI linguist. She is the Women's Intelligence Network Vice Chair and Program Manager for the Intelligence Community Center for Academic Excellence Program at the Director of National Intelligence. We also want to welcome our other panel members, linguist subject matter experts from across the intelligence community, Mr. Han and Angela. The intent of our program today is to raise awareness of the many cross-disciplinary facets of intelligence. Many students may not realize that language competency is a precious commodity in the intelligence community and that there are fascinating careers available for them. I've had a, I've had a, uh, I, I will say a lifelong love of foreign languages uh, starting, I'd say in middle school, um, which led to an undergraduate degree uh, in, in two languages, uh, which, uh, also led to adjust my camera here, uh, which also led to a, a graduate um, degree uh, in uh, in foreign language, and I'm going to try to get this a little bit better for you. Um, there we go. Um, and I'll probably get back over here. So uh, it's uh, that love of foreign languages led me to a. Uh, Spend the first 15 years of my uh, career uh, working in foreign languages uh, in the IC and also uh, overseeing the work of, of foreign language analysts there as well. Uh, the, um, my continuing love for foreign language has, I think, led me to back into the field and, and back into this particular position. So, so, so why am I here um, today? Uh, I think it's really to uh, I think to try to promote uh, the importance of uh, foreign language use uh, in the IC and the need for for foreign language skills uh, in in the intelligence community. Where uh, I think, as Craig mentioned before, you know, there's uh, really these foreign language skills are, are a very incredibly important commodity um, throughout um, throughout the IC. Um, um, when you look at our our mission. Um, which is to uh, really uh, answer a lot of the a lot of the intelligence questions that our policymakers have, our military commanders have, um, and other decision ma makers in the uh, in the U.S. government have. Uh, the uh, foreign language skills play a critical role in in providing that information, and uh, it's uh, when you take a look at the. Uh, information that we collect, uh, and I'll say almost all of it, um, is in uh, a foreign language. Um, the need for the correct uh, processing of that information, whether it's uh, voice uh, information or graphic information, uh, is extremely important because if you don't uh, get the foreign language processing correct at that particular point of your analysis, then all, I think, subsequent uh, analysis um, fails. Um, so, uh, but we, we haven't really done, I think, uh, I think a great job of promoting uh, in the IC uh, the, uh, the, the importance of, of foreign language, but, but really kind of end there at that point by saying that uh, foreign language skills are a critical mission skill in the IC. Uh, and we need, we need, you know, we need more um, individuals with, with skills how they develop skills in, in languages you know, that we need. Um, the uh, people always like to you know right off at, uh, at the beginning of this presentation, uh, you know, what uh, languages are you looking for? And uh, I will kind of always caveat on this statement <clears throat> to say that, um, and it's really, I think no, no surprise at this point that, but the, I think the overwhelming number of positions that we have in the intelligence community um, for which uh, foreign language skills are the primary job, job responsibility 
uh, are in uh, Arabic, Chinese, you know, Farsi, Farsi slash Persian, uh, Korean, Russian, and Spanish. And then uh, the, the next really thing I'd like to say is that, does that mean we're not looking for uh, individuals with skills in other foreign languages? Uh, and, and the answer is that we uh, are always looking for individuals with, uh, with, with qualified, really highly qualified skills uh, in, in foreign languages. Uh, it's just that um, you know, the particular priorities uh, right now um, and, and for the U.S. national security interests of those, of those six, you know, that I mentioned. But don't don't be, uh, I think, discouraged at this point. But if you did not hear um, the languages um, that the languages you are, you are proficient in, um, the uh, I think it's uh, really important to say as well at this particular point in time that uh, we cannot find uh, enough. Um, skilled uh, individuals to, to work uh, the foreign language positions we have uh, in which uh, language skills or use of foreign language skills uh, are uh, the primary you know, job responsibility. The, um, I will state uh, right now that uh, the, the benchmark that we use, the reference that we use in, in the intelligence community for, for measuring competency uh, is uh, the uh, interagency language um, roundtable uh, standards, um, and uh, I'm going to really throw out a, a website here because to talk about those standards uh, and, the, and their criteria and competencies would, would take us another hour or so. But uh, but if you would, were to go to www.govtilr.org, and I'll repeat that again: uh, www.govtilr.org then uh, you will get a, um, a better idea of, uh, of, the, of those particular competencies and criteria you know, that, that we use to measure uh, foreign language um, skill levels. And for uh, our, uh, our purposes, uh, we are, if we can find, if kind of look, looking at the perfect candidate, uh, the, uh, we would love to find in, individuals with um, I'm going to use a short, you know, this acronym of ILR, ILR, level three skills in all four modalities um, at level three, right? ILR, level three skills in all four modalities. Um, is, that, is that a pretty demanding um, standard? I would say that um, it's becoming more and more, I think, the, uh, the minimum level of competency and skill that, that we're looking for to uh, execute our mission. Now, uh, without really going off on too much of a tangent, uh, I'll certainly say that, uh, you know, I always, in learning, uh, developing foreign language skills, uh, I learned, I try to develop equal skills in all four competencies, right? The listening, speaking, reading, and writing. And it just so happens that, you know, there's just people have natural tendencies and, and gifts um, to, um, to develop strengths and in, in, in maybe to um, of modalities opposed to the other two, uh, but but I think you if you can kind of aim for that you know as a goal, um, then I think that that's going to make you um, very very competitive for employment uh, in the uh, in the IC. Uh, it's uh, I, I was very happy to hear uh, Craig told me that you do have a language a flagship um, program there, uh, and uh, I the I've, I've been very impressed at the uh, flagship programs I've visit, visited uh, over the past five years on their ability to uh, develop individuals with, uh, with level three skills. So if you're looking for kind of a baseline you know, of, of skills that you should aim for, um, it, it, uh, I think that, that that's the advice I would give you. Uh, I think it is, uh, uh, and, and I will kind of move on to another early topic at that point um, and, and leave the time uh, at the end of this presentation um, to answer any specific questions about that. Um, the, I would say that, uh, as I said before, we have, we have lots and lots and lots of jobs where language, uh, it, language skills are primary job responsibility. We have a number of, we have lots of other jobs as well where language for language skills uh, are complementary, right? It's complementary um, skill, but no less important, um, mostly in, in kind of analytic positions. So 
uh, if your early interest in, in working uh, after school is kind of like an analytic field, um, this also, you, you're going to need to use your foreign language skills as well and coming in with strong language skills. Um, I, I think it's uh, important um, for that purpose as well, because you're, you just never, never know when you're going to need those skills. Uh, but I will say also that uh, any, whether the job I'm talking about is a job that requires uh, foreign language as a primary job skill or secondary job skill, you're also going to need uh, strong research skills, strong critical thinking skills, uh, and strong communication skills as well. Uh, the, uh, to try to go into a little bit more detail about, about the language job itself, uh, I will say that uh, it's uh, um, given the limitations we have here, I will, I will say that there's a learning curve even when you come into the community because you're, you're not dealing with a lot of uh, you know, kind of clear speech and text and uh, nice formatted uh, language and books. You're dealing often with, uh, with corrupted text in different dialects um, and uh, you know, garbled speech and you know, a variety of different uh, domains. Um, so uh, it, there's, there's quite a learning curve there and a challenge there. Um, but I will um, say that um, the, um, if, if you're coming into this job um, with, with, uh, uh, and looking for a place um, to, <clears throat> to use your foreign language skills, I think uh, an IC, the IC is a great place to work. Uh, we are really looking for, you know, for people who have a passion for, for foreign language. Uh, we are, it, our particular mission using foreign language can be pretty hard. Um, and it, it requires, you know, a, a really, I think a very dedicated and persistent approach to, to, to working our particular mission. <clears throat> I kind of like to think that I'm, I'm one of those, have been one of those people my entire life. I still work foreign language. Um, I will drive in to work each day. I'll, I'll listen to the local Spanish radio broadcast for about 20, 30 minutes. On the way home, I'll, I'll pick an Apple podcast in a, in a romance language and listen to it on the way back. So uh, if you're, um, you know, if, if that's kind of uh, passion we're looking for, uh, for people who would like to uh, work um, for us um, in a uh, foreign language field, uh, we uh, will, um, we'll probably, we have leave time at the end here uh, to talk about uh, training opportunities for you, um, for incentive uh, pay that we have, uh, and uh, how to um, acquire a job in the IC, uh, as well as giving you other, you know, other links uh, through the IC. Um, so uh, it is, uh, uh, I think, uh, and kind of as like close here, for my comments, just to reiterate what I stated uh, at the beginning of this presentation that, that uh, foreign language skills are critically important to our mission. Uh, I know I mentioned the six highest priority languages at this particular point in time, but if you have other languages in which you think you have uh, highly developed skills, let's, let's talk as well because we cover the entire world um, from, you know, from where we work. And th those particular mission requirements change from, uh, from time to time. Um, and and um, lastly, if you, know, you really have that kind of passion for working foreign languages, um, then, then we really would love to talk to you. And so I'll just close by saying that, yes, there are, there are jobs here in the IC for you with, with foreign language skills. Nazareth, over to you. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, um, Craig, for the invitation to speak to the students and the university personnel. Um, and I'm really super happy and excited to be on a panel uh, and working once again with one of my uh, biggest mentors, Mr. Don Gentile and uh, David, and look forward to hearing from David and, and Angie. So I'll just, um, I'll start with giving you um, a brief introduction about myself and I'll pause and then I'll um, go over to uh, David and uh, Angie and we'll take your questions um, in the end just so we give enough time for each panelist uh, to speak. Um, Nazareth Berhane, as uh, Craig introduced me, I am originally from Ethiopia, Eritrea, born and raised in Khartoum, Sudan, that's in East Africa. And that's where I picked up my first language, Arabic. Uh, went to Catholic schools from pre-K all the way through high school. Um, and that's where I picked English. Uh, my heritage, Eritrean and Ethiopian, is where I picked up my third language, uh, which is Tigrinya. 
the language spoken in Eritrea and in one uh, region in Ethiopia, Tigray. Um, so that's a little bit about me and my background. Um, you know, as an immigrant, I moved to the U.S. in '94. Um, I did not anticipate to join the IC. I did not anticipate to work for the Bureau. I never um, thought that I would use my foreign language skills because I just took them for granted. It was just something that you know I grew up with. Um, but because what I saw, um, what I like to say is what I saw represented to me, like um, CIA, the FBI and the movies and all of that, I really did not see somebody that looked like me. So I, the last thing I thought was I would be working for the FBI. Uh, but my husband now, boyfriend then, uh, heard me complain so much about my um, master's degree uh, school loans. It was about $30,000, $40,000. I did my uh, master's degree at University of Maryland in management information systems. And it was something that I really wanted to do. And one of the reasons why I came to the US to just seek a better life and uh, for freedom. I finished my degree, accumulated the loan and um, I was looking to find more income. And that's when it was right, right after 9-11 and the, the FBI along with other intelligence community agencies were looking to hire people who speak Arabic. So I signed, I filled out the application, forgot about it. Um, and at the time I was working for a private company, um, company in the private sector that was doing data analytics as a data analyst and then program manager. I got laid off to cut a long story short, got laid off from that job. And it just so happened that the FBI background investigator was completing my background investigation um, at the point that I was laid off. So a few months after I got laid off from my private sector job, I joined the Bureau and I have not looked back since. That was in 2004. So I was hired as a contract linguist in Arabic and Tigrinya, but because of the need for Arabic more than anything, most of my time, um, the first few years in the Bureau were just using my Arabic language skills. Um, and I'd love to talk to you about how um, somebody from um, you know, my background and similar backgrounds contribution to the IC is more than just the language um, translation and interpretation, if you will. I, continued working for the Bureau as an Arabic linguist and then was offered the full-time employment, became an employee, um, enjoyed it, but then was getting, you know, like, oh, I like this, but I want to do something else. Um, my boss at the time mentored me to um, take over his, uh, to, to take over his position on a uh, temporary basis whenever he was traveling. And that was a job as the Middle East uh, Languages Program as for the national FBI program. So once he was promoted, I uh, was ready to take that position. And I did. I managed the FBI's Middle East program for a few years. And then my mentor said, I needed to branch out of my comfort zone and do something other than working, you know, with foreign language in the Bureau. So I signed up for a joint duty assignment, uh, which is a temporary assignment of another agency still belonging to the Bureau and did a joint duty assignment uh, at US Air Force for a year, and then joined Don Gentile's office at ODNI, the Office of the Director of National Intelligence for um, one of the most amazing opportunities of my life uh, for two and a half years. And then I went back to my home agency at the Bureau to manage the Chinese program, stayed there for about a year and a half, and now I work at ODNI full-time. I say all of that to say that the, your career in the uh, intelligence community will be uh, driven by your ability to, you know, volunteer, raise your hand, um, listen to advice from people around you, push yourself to do things beyond uh, what is, you know, given to you. And I credit that and my mentors and the support of people around me, including my family and um, folks like Don and my colleagues with where I am now. Um, I am a program manager at the Intelligence Community Centers for Academic Excellence. So as you can see, my, my career is, while not having you know, climbed up the ladder, um, it has afforded, working in the intelligence community has afforded me a very rich and diverse experience because I wasn't just working in the Bureau um, all my life. You can move out for a temporary uh, duty assignment and you know, experience and support other agencies and come back or you could do what I did 
because I'm a mom of two teens and wanted to have less ops uh, experience that was very like, um, you know, up tempo and it's and very stressful and, you know, on the phone all the time, continue to, to support the intelligence community, but in a job uh, where I am right now that allowed me a little bit more flexibility. So like Don mm -hmm. said, there are so many opportunities for you to use your foreign language skills in um, different ways that I would love to talk to you about, but I will pause now um, and just share quickly about the picture behind me. I don't know if you can see it. Um, it's one picture that I took with me before I left the bureau. And it's one of the cool assignments that I had the opportunity to participate in in Quantico. As a linguist, we were asked to uh, do some role-playing exercise to help uh, personnel before deploying overseas. And that was um, a group, a diverse group of people from so many different languages, Somali, and myself, Arabic. Um, we had different groups. We were just there in Quantico, just role-playing with the soldiers and trying to help them prepare before they, before they deployed. Um, and it was really an amazing experience that allowed us to share beyond the language, the cultural nuances, um, you know, like what to say and what not to say, how to ask a question, who to address. Um, so that's one vignette that I wanted to share with you that Craig had asked us to um, share with you by way of, you know, kind of sharing insight about what it is to be a linguist in an agency like um, FBI. So I'll pause now, and I'd like to now give the floor to um, David Hunt to share with us about his career as a linguist and maybe share one uh, or two vignettes, time permitting, um, about his career as a linguist. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, just first, could everyone hear me? Good job, Dave, yep. Okay, great. So again, thank you everyone, um, especially the students who are interested in furthering language capabilities and participating in their language studies. My name is David Hahn. I am a Sergeant First Class in the United States Army, and I am a 35 mic by my job description, my MOS. And what a 35 mic is, is actually a human intelligence collector. And so when I first joined the Army, the 35 mic position did not have a language attachment to it. Um, however, as of last year, I believe all 35 mics who are now entering the military are given a language as part of that requirement to fulfill their job description. And so if my understanding is correct, they go, they get trained at DLI, and then they go on to further their MOS training. I'm what's known as a home environment uh, language person, which means I grew up in a Korean household. And through the conversations I had with my parents and my grandmother, I gained a language capability that when I then joined the military, I was able to hone a little bit further towards more specific terminologies or different dialects. And it's aided me a lot in my career. So with that being said, I'd like to provide three quick vignettes of how linguists and then language itself are able to really present a fuller picture for the IC and then also the opportunities available specifically within the army for those who have a language that they're able to use, regardless of if they're specifically a language coded linguist or in, an, in another capacity. The first vignette has to do with when I was deployed in Afghanistan in 2012, 2013. And so in this case, I'm expressing this story not as the linguist, but rather as a person who has a relationship with the linguist, the translator. And as a linguist, I realized there or working with a linguist, I realized at that time how important that relationship is to be on the same page when going to approach people to talk to and to relying on the linguist to provide cultural context. The linguist is a true force multiplier in that case where while I'm speaking words, the linguist is providing context and background and historical knowledge and cultural references that they're not only translating, but they're also then letting us know um, this feels a little off, this doesn't sound right, or yes, this is how this person from this area would say a certain thing. And so that relationship was very important and allowed, and again, it made me realize, wow, having a good relationship with a good linguist really does, in fact, increase the overall amount of information that we're able to uh, collect, especially in a short amount of time. 
The second uh, vignette I like to discuss is when I was deployed in Korea, I was deployed with Eighth Army. And it was at that point that I was actually able to use my language capability, um, but more, rather than use it, I was able to realize how much I still had to learn. And so a home environment linguist, I could partake in daily conversations. I can you know, make my way through Korea or speak with other Koreans, but linguists are very, very um, unique in that not only can they do that, but well-trained, uh, good linguists who hone that craft could shift to politics, could talk military terminology. They could discuss nuclear terminology um, and then go into a baseball game and discuss those types of things as well. And so when I was in Korea, I realized I'm a home environment linguist, um, but both my verbal knowledge of certain topics, as well as my ability to translate really lacked. And so interpreting, saying things on the oral side, I, I could get away with things and it was pretty, at a fundamental level, it was fine. But the translating, the translating part was very difficult for me. So I was given an opportunity to participate in what was called CLEEP, the Korean Language Enhancement Program out at a Korean university for six weeks. And it was a full immersion program. And that truly then focused in the, the they honed in on the speaking specific military terminology, understand the uh, like Korean breakdown of the military and the various echelons and the words associated to those echelons and how we can speak to both our peers, subordinates, but also our officers that we're briefing to, or in fact, providing interpretation support. And so truly the second vignette is just a way to say that the linguist capacity is speaking, reading, writing, understanding culture, and it, the, the various methods in which you can enhance those different uh, skill sets, it's a daily activity. And it truly is something that if you want to really become immersed in, it will become a culture of your own that you really then are able to provide force added, uh, force multiplying capabilities. And then the last vignette is my current duty. So I'm as I stated, I'm a 35 Mike human intelligence collector. Um, I'm currently assigned as a task force officer to the FBI. And so in the Southern California region. So in the Southern California region, we're able to meet with a variety of people all from different backgrounds and cultures. And during some of the interviews that we conduct, I've realized, or I've been given the opportunity to conduct those interviews in Korean. And so with my kind of knowledge that I gained while I was in Korea, the fact that I knew I needed to study more, immerse myself more, and then given this opportunity now, I've been able to not only be a person who provides certain information that we can gain in the area to various members of the FBI, but also again, provide that cultural aspect of it. But as the translator for a lot of these um, meetings that we do, another thing that linguists and hopeful linguists in the future should also keep in mind is the mental taxation that occurs when you're conducting these meetings. Um, from English to said language, and then hearing the response and bringing it back in English, and then the follow on. And so that, if we really want to think about it, a 30 minute conversation is usually an hour to an hour 15 minute conversation. And then if the subject that we're speaking to is speaking in very long sentences, we have to ensure that we break in order to let our, the person we're interpreting know, to, we're interpreting for know of what's going on. So they're in on the conversation as well. So it is, it's extremely fun. It's extremely challenging, but there are, it's also extremely mentally taxing. And so it's something to be ready for and be prepared for when it is that you do conduct these types of things. Um, but the fact that, that I have a, a home environment language really led me to this current position. And in the military specifically, um, one of the first questions that's being asked when applying to a lot of these programs with either specific units or specific groups are, do you have a language? And so the fact that you're here listening, trying to gain this information and further your language capabilities is a, mm -hmm. it's an incredible first step towards getting, toward, towards getting to whatever goal that it is you want to accomplish. Mm -hmm. And I highly commend you for that.
Um, I'm free for any questions once our next speaker uh, concludes. And again, my name is Sergeant First Class David Hahn. I'm with the United States Army. Thank you so much, David. Um, listening to you reminded me how terrible an interpreter I am. I love doing the translation work for a while, but I sucked at interpretation. So it's a skill set that is not for everybody. And it's not a bad thing because at different agencies, you have the ability to use your language in different ways, not just for translation. Um, I would like to next invite our amazing uh, next panelist, Angie, to share with us about um, her experience as, as a linguist. And then I'll close with my second vignette um, that David reminded me to share about. Angie, over to you. Hi, everyone. Um, I hope you can hear me OK. I wanted to share a little bit about how my career in the language field really moved from academia and then into the IC. And in some ways, while it's not quite back into academia, did go back into teaching as well as continuing to work the language. So when I, I like to joke that I was studying Arabic when Arabic was not cool at all. Um, so I began studying Arabic as an undergrad and it wasn't until after I had finished my master's that 9-11 took place and suddenly people were actually realizing that, hey, Arabic isn't like a dead language or like people need these skills or this might actually be practical. Believe me, my parents were like, why are you studying this, this language that we may, you know, you may never have the opportunity to do anything with outside of academia. Um, however, I stuck with it. I had a professor as a sophomore in college and I just fell in love with the way she taught and the way of, and with the language. Um, and I continued all the way through. And because I am liberal arts and I was promised there would never be math again once I'd finished those requirements in my first year of college, I added a lot of cultural studies to my major within Arabic and Islamic studies. Um, and then also added the language Persian once I got to do my master's. Um, so I actually was leaving for my immersion training program right um, around the time of 9-11. Um, I was still able to complete my program and I came back to a very changed environment in the US and I realized that instead of translating literature, perhaps I could do something very different and perhaps I could uh, go and put my training to use um, within the IC. So I applied. It took a little longer. Be careful where you travel <laughs> because it can take longer. So keep that in mind as you're pursuing your own languages. Um, but I did get through the hoops and began my career as a language analyst. Um, I know I can't go into all the weeds of the kinds of um, activities that we did, but as Don referenced at the beginning, we are providing that information to policymakers, stakeholders, um, people on the ground within, um, you know, um, in conflict areas and so forth. And our role is really to make it clear, you know, what perhaps our adversaries' intentions are um, and to understand nuance, to be able to both, you know, translate or in the circumstances that um, Nazareth mentioned and that um, David Hahn mentioned to be able to do interpretation as well, to be comfortable speaking and writing as well as listening and reading. And all of those skills are priority skills, although one can always find a balance. Um, so I got my position as a language analyst and I really loved it. There's a lot of collaboration. You're not you're not just in a little tiny box working alone. You really work as a team and you share insights and perspectives with the people you work with. Um, that said, because I had come from a background where I had done a lot of student teaching as well, it wasn't too long into my career that I was invited um, to begin building courses as well to help with some of that steep learning curve that Dawn, for example, was describing at the beginning. When you're new to this, you have no idea how to, what a translation really should look like. Um, you know, we get sort of spoiled when we read novels that were originally written in a different language. We don't realize the kind of effort it took for those folks to write with nuance and detail. And that's very true, you know, depending on what your language work is in this kind of context as well. You have to understand nuance and details. Um, so I began, in addition to continuing to do my language work, building courses to help bring people to that level and to understand what the job required. Um, and I was very fortunate to get to work on some courses for very domain specific um, topics, um, to work on 
cyber materials within the language context to really help people have a better leg up because you might grow up speaking a language but you don't know anything about that domain or you might have studied a lot of you know cyber and technology but you don't have the language skills um, so being able to cross and bring that together is a huge priority um, and then throughout that entire period i was able to go back and forth so we could always maintain awareness of what challenges the language community is facing and then make sure that we're making that training effective throughout the community and then being able to spread it further. So I hope that knowing that that's a career path because I certainly did not know that this was what could be ahead of me when I was studying might help you see that there's a lot more than just, oh, I could go get some sort of government job. It's an amazing experience and it allows you to do a lot of things that you know, you might never have the opportunity to try otherwise. So I don't want to belabor it too much because I'm sure by now you have questions and comments and so forth. Um, so I'll stop there. But um, it is a really amazing opportunity. Thank you so much, Angie, for sharing that. Um, before we go into questions, I just wanted to uh, share my second uh, vignette that um, I was kind of reminded of as I listened to David talk about language. Um, the very few times that I was able to use my Tigrinya language skill, which um, is not, I would say it's like third. So I understand when somebody speaks to me and I can speak, but not very proficiently. Uh, so I hesitated before uh, supporting any type of assignment uh, at the Bureau. But the one thing that I do know very well and I'm very comfortable in is my culture, uh, Ethiopian Eritrean culture and also the Sudanese culture. So one of my uh, really cool assignments that I was really um, happy and grateful to, to participate in is helping a um, an Eritrean person who was at the time in the year uh, in the U.S. an older woman and this is completely unclassified and is uh, the case has been prosecuted so I can talk about it um, who was working as a living nanny uh, for a family that I think at the time um, is also Ethiopian. But she was being um, abused by the uh, by her employer, the, the husband and uh, the wife, and she struggled a lot to speak up and talk about what it is that was bothering her because they took her passport. And I mean, if you Google it, you'll know a lot of immigrants from that part of the world and um, other parts of the world um, come maybe with you know the blinders on and are completely oblivious to the fact that they can step outside the door, which is something that you and and I know you could just step outside the door and, and call for help, or you could just call dial 911. She was petrified. She They took her passport. They wouldn't pay her. And it was really, uh, on top of everything else, she was being sexually abused. So it was a very traumatic experience for her. And as much as we tried to, uh, as, as much as um, we tried to kind of get the information from her to help prosecute the case, it, we were not successful. I was introduced to the case and because I remembered, you know, in my upbringing, how um, religion and faith, um, our, our, our culture is faith based. I remember my mom and my grandma being, you know, going to church and how like simple things like, you know, the holy water that they get from the church meant a really big deal to them. Uh, with my very, with my limited uh, Tigrinya proficiency, what I took was that cultural uh, background. I went into the interview, the first interview, and I talked to my mom about how to kind of help break the barriers. I took uh, holy water from church, and that was my introduction to her. Um, I just addressed her as, you know, mama, which is, you know, a very um, polite way of saying, you know, grandma, and I remember it you know, growing up that when you speak to an elder, you have to speak very politely and, you know, you have to uh, be careful what you say and how you say it. So eventually, as I started to, you know, make her feel more comfortable and let her know, you know, that I understand and I'm sorry, she opened up and she started telling us the details about the abuse that happened and, you know, how it was um, hard for her to even speak up and say anything, but because I'm a woman, she could, you know, talk to me. And that's one of the key takeaways that you know we as linguists, um, I'm sure David and, and Angie would agree with me, is you are able as a linguist to bring that nuance to a uh, an assignment beyond just saying you know like you translate from English into Arabic and, and the other way around. You help um, 
the, the agent or whoever who's doing the interview prepare before the interview and you know say, um, because this is an older woman, because she grew up in a conservative culture, she is more than likely uh, not able to, not comfortable speaking to a male. So it's better to bring a woman and it, it's better to bring somebody that is older, then she will open up to you and then maybe she can speak uh, a little bit more uh, freely. So that's the second vignette I wanted to share with you. And also like David and Don and Angie shared, being a linguist in any um, of the intelligence community agencies is not a career that is, you know, set. It's like a box that you kind of feel you have to stick to. You can start as a linguist and then do instruction, do um, the cultural briefings. You can also use your, your foreign language skills to support uh, an office like Don's office, like I did, program management, going in like the policy and strategy direction, but leaning on my background as a linguist and as somebody who managed two critical language programs. Uh, so there are so many different ways that your foreign language skills, your ability to provide that you know, context and, and, and background can be crucial to any given agency. Um, so don't just uh, think that as a linguist, you're just going to translate audio uh, and document. There is a lot that you can offer the intelligence community and, and we're definitely looking forward to having a whole lot of you apply um, to join the intelligence community, not just the Bureau or NSA or CIA. With that, I would like to give the uh, mic back to Craig. Um, I don't know if you have questions or if you wanna moderate the Q&A or if Don has a uh, follow-up commentary or if my panelists had follow-up commentary. Yeah, I mean, we can we can definitely open it up for questions at the moment. If you do have a question, please uh, feel free to post it to the chat room and we'll definitely field the questions. But also I would like to uh, turn it back to uh, Mr. Gentile to see if he has any follow-up while we wait for questions in the chat, okay? Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I'd say uh, thanks, uh, thanks, and thanks to, uh, to David, to, to Angie, to Nazareth uh, for uh, outstanding uh, presentations. I uh, yeah, neglected to uh, talk a little bit about uh, the, I think the process uh, of, of getting into uh, getting into intelligence community and uh, I and, and kind of what the requirements are um, for, um, I think, you know, get, becoming a, a, a foreign language analyst uh, in the intelligence community and. Uh, I like to to tell people when I'm going around the country and 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 and, and making pitches for for people to join us. Uh, I kind of say, look, looking for people. It would be nice if you had a, a strong academic record uh, uh, in your academic career. It, it doesn't have to be in a foreign language. Your foreign language uh, competencies and capabilities are acquired in a variety of different ways. Uh, I I think we're I think more and more looking for um, you know we, we'd love to have people with, you know, with, with that expertise in the foreign language. But um, I think as, as Angie stated, if you, know, if you have other skills as well, complementary skills, we're looking for you for, to work for us for an entire career. So, so you know, that, that's important as well. Uh, I think we've neglected to, to talk about um, the, um, the eligibility to, to get a security clearance. And um, that's, that we could take a whole hour um, in and of itself to talk about that, but, um, uh, it's important. It's an important factor of, um, in uh, in our processing. Uh, I I think uh, the other advice that I do give uh, to people is uh, uh, that more and more members of the community are, in fact, almost everybody now is recommending that if you're applying for a position that you do it online through um, a particular um, agency's uh, website. I know the ICCA program is another option there, and there are lots of other options as well. But but uh, the point being made is. Um, that uh, getting a resume in, in great shape, um, kind of stating right up front, you know, that hey, if you want to work for language, state that. Um, and uh, you know, I think um, you know we were, we're happy to help, and I'm, I'm sure Craig's happy to help as well. Uh, I think that uh, the important part, uh, I think, an important strategic point to, to mention as well is that uh, is don't limit yourself to to applying to one particular IC element or agency. Uh, that maybe you've, you've had a desire to work for you for your entire life. If uh, I, I would apply to all members of the community that have a foreign language mission and get your foot in the door, uh, it's, a lot, it's a lot easier to, uh, uh, to, to move around once you get in. 
Uh, and, uh, and lastly, you know, in, in the job seeking process, really not only for foreign language jobs, but also for uh, other, other positions, I, I always say that you, you know, need, to, need to keep in mind the four Ps, which is kind of, you know, you have a your passion, you, know, you really want to work for the community, but having persistence uh, and, and patience um, to, to kind of see this through, because it's, uh, it's not always a short process. Processing time does take a while, particularly for those uh, who have had some overseas travel. Um, and, um, and then I would say the fourth P is, is the pain part because you know, it, it's, um, it's just not easy, um, but, but it's worth it um, if you can, you know, if this is something you really want to do, um, you know, we can help you through it. And, and we'd really love to see you come work for us at some point in your professional career. Back to you, Craig. All right, thank you. Uh, it's a really good um, overview, uh, Mr. Gentile, about not only is there an application process, but you do have a security clearance process too if you want to work with the US government. But you will have the same background checks and similar things that you have to do when you're working with security agencies that are non government. So it's just something to be considered. And one thing that you can do to prepare right now is probably a question, you know, it's probably begging the question is start. Um, Start looking through your affiliations and your associations online, your, your network traffic, and, and see what, you know, it's your integrity. You have to declare these things when you join the U.S. government. Anything that is could be against the law or you, you've been affiliated or associated with somebody that has broken the law, that's just something you must declare. Also, uh, affiliations with foreign governments or people in your family that may not be U.S. citizens that live in other countries, you have to declare those things. And that's really what it is. It's all about integrity. Are you willing to declare these things and adhere to a kind of a clean background going forward to work for the government? So I just want to quickly point that out. But someone did have a question here, and it's uh, it's about the aptitude uh, for languages in, in the intelligence community. Uh, the question was, are there tests that you, know, you could take, and then what do those look like to measure the aptitude of the language speaker? And I'll turn it over to the panel uh, to answer that question. Okay. <clears throat> Um, I've spoken a lot. Does anyone else want to jump in? I'm happy to answer it. If, um, but I'll give I'll give uh, panel members out there a chance to to speak up. Then I can jump in. I'm happy sure. to talk about testing. Nazareth wants to. Um, well, I yeah. think it's important to talk for like for the students to hear from all of us because each one of us represents an element that ha might have a unique um, set of tests. So over to you, Angie. And apologies for the interruption. No worries. Um, yes, every every element has a different style of test. Actually, um, I can tell you that um, the Defense Department has, for the most part, defaulted to the Defense Language Proficiency Test, um, which is used to test both, or I should say, all the categories of adult learners, native speakers, and heritage speakers, because it is looking both at your language, your global language proficiency within the language. And then as well, it, it because the questions are written in English, it's also sort of checking your English proficiency. That said, other elements have tests that are much more focused on your speaking and listening skills. And I'll let um, Nazareth address some of those as well. And um, if David wants to pick any of that up too. Oh. David, would you like to go ahead and I'll go last. Sure, sounds good. Um, so yes, the specifically the United States Army, but in general, the DOD also utilize, or utilizes the DOPT, the Defense Language Proficiency Test. Um, that is for a, when you are in training, uh, upon completion of training to gauge an idea of where you are. And then annually for us, if we are given a language coded position to try to maintain and or improve upon that rating. Um, it is a, so specifically for Korean, it is a reading and listening component test. And it is essentially, it, I, don't I don't take the, the oral portion of it. So I just do the reading and the listening portions of it. And <clears throat> those, so I was again, a, a native speaker or a heritage speaker. Uh, for those who are interested in joining the military and are seeing what opportunities are out there in terms of potential languages, there's a test also called the DLAB, which is the Defense Language Aptitude Battery. And so what that test is, is essentially a, it's, a, it's supposed to be a test that'll see how much aptitude a person has to gain and acquire the skills to learn a new language. 
Um, I did take that test and for me, it was more of a uh, nonsense test, meaning it's not based off of any specific rules that I was able to figure out or anything I could like truly prepare for. It was a lot of it was just kind of identifying certain uh, structures or patterns, but in a in a non language or a nonsense language. Um, but that is also an option given to those who do not have a language are coming into the army and then the military wants to see the, again the aptitude of the person to potentially learn a language. And if I could add uh, from my perspective and uh, that um, <clears throat> if you're you're a student and looking to assess your current language capabilities. I've seen over the past couple of years, more and more uh, private sector entities pro um, providing uh, tests to uh, assess your, your language skills. And if you could certainly just Google that um, and, and maybe you know, um, <clears throat> uh, Google it under our language testing uh, for interagency language roundtable you know, skill competencies or skill levels. Uh, and and take you know have, see if you can take one of those those tests. Uh, it may cost you some money, but but I think it's an I think it would be an effective uh, investment uh, of your your time and money. Uh, because I will say when I when I look at resumes um, and you know you, you could you can say in your job objective that you want to work in the IC as a you know a language professional, um, and then they're going to ask you what languages you know, you're you you think you're you're skilled at, and then kind of the language level and. I, I've seen, um, you know, far far too many resumes that kind of say, you know, general proficiency or advanced level, and 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 if you drill down a little bit uh, with uh, with them in those discussions, it's uh, there's really no test that they've taken, you know, to kind of prove that. So if you can you can kind of show uh, in your in your resume, um, hey, look, I've taken this test. It's measured my um, IRR, IRR level skills, and here's here it is in the four modalities. Uh, it makes a really strong a really strong argument um, for someone to <clears throat> to show interest in you in you as a as a potential employee, and uh, I know it's um, it, it would cost you some money, but I think it's uh, I think it's an effective strategy, and that you hopefully can look into uh, moving forward. Over. Oh, that's a good response. Uh, thank you for that insight. Um, so they can take so students can take a test uh, from a third party. And provide that on their resume. It's a credentialing service. Did you did you mention that, Don? Which one it was? You said you can Google it. I think there were a bunch of them. I, I, I okay, gotcha. Uh, so I don't want to show partiality to to any, but but I think if you just Google it, you you come up with at least a handful that would be able to provide that provide that service. But I think it's a worthwhile step to take. Makes sense. Okay, and uh, so we have a few questions now for the panel. We have first one was is about uh, sign language. And uh, Zachary Arnett asks, how applicable is universal sign language to the linguistics fields? Does anybody want to jump on that one? <clears throat> well, I think that, that question has come up uh, before uh, with uh, <clears throat> NEIC. It is um, <clears throat> not certainly considered a traditional um, uh, uh, foreign language. Um, it, it would, I think, fall outside of probably the, the topic areas that we've been discussing today. Um, is, are, is there a need for individuals with, um, with those skills uh, in the IC? Um, the answer is yes. Um, is, is it um, one that's applied to, to the operational side? Um, probably not as much as um, it, it could be um, used um, outside of that uh, arena. Uh, but but definitely, I, I've seen um, many cases where where those skills are 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 needed. So it, it would be kind of follow the same application process if uh, if interested. Okay. Does anyone else from the panel uh, want to address the question? Okay, none heard. So we have another uh, follow on question with cyber applications, uh, and uh, Ben Bearden asked it. There are any ways that foreign languages are used in more technical fields, such as cybersecurity? Yeah, you fit. Um, <clears throat> that's a great question in the sense that um, it's it's a great need for us. I think we're <clears throat> we are. Um, you know, if you look at uh, at at how foreign languages are taught across our you know, in our schools, um, you're being taught. In most cases, not all cases, a language and literature, right? And 
uh, it's it's rare that you're going to uh, come in um, to a professional environment with uh, developed uh, expertise uh, in um, in the in domains like cyber or CDRN um, or other related fields, financial terms. Uh, it's in fact, I would say that um, I you probably wouldn't develop that kind of uh, domain expertise even in English if I were asked to transcribe uh, in English medical terms or legal terms, I would not do very, very well. So we, we do recognize that that's a need. Uh, and uh, we uh, are, are trying to develop ways uh, to provide training to, to develop that expertise. But it has been uh, a need for us. Uh, and uh, if people have, uh, individuals have those skills, that's another plus you should list uh, on your resume. And we would have certainly have a great need for it and, and a place for you. Over. That's good. Does anybody else uh, want to comment from the panel? Yeah, I'll, I'll jump in real quick um, to Ben's question. Um, so <clears throat> specifically in terms of as a human intelligence collector, we go and speak with people about a variety of different topics. And sometimes those people speak a different language. And sometimes those topics are in the security or programming language. So we're talking multiple languages here. And I am not that person to go and talk to that person about because I just don't have that capacity. So essentially, I'm providing a context of this is where I would reach out to an analyst. Um, and so if an analyst is able to provide both the cyber portion or security portion of the language decoding for me, and that analyst also has the capabilities to look at foreign language that this was conducted in or some of the um, context around it is conducted in, I cannot think of a better person that I would personally want to reach out to. So this is all in the way of saying, absolutely, both the subject matter that's being discussed is of very, 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 you know, inter high interest and very important, but also the knowledge of being able to not only look at things from a programming aspect, but also from the foreign language aspect. Um, for somebody like me to then reach out to for that assistance and subject matter expertise would be great. Over. Thank you, David. Sandra or Nazareth, uh, are you, we, should we go to the next question or would you like to comment on that um, last question? I'd like to comment quickly on the question because I think it's a an ex extremely important question um, that we get asked at recruiting events, not just for cybersecurity, but for any um, specific area of expertise that some of the students bring with them in addition to foreign language. So cybersecurity obviously being one of the top uh, fields that would be required, I would say absolutely yes. And um, pulling back from my experience managing two critical languages program in the Bureau, um, some of the requests that we would field were very specific uh, within the language. So it would be, you know, Arabic and um, like Angie was saying earlier, it could be, you know, like counterterrorism or counterintelligence um, and it's very specific and unique. Even though Arabic is my first language, I grew up, you know, speaking it. Um, I speak more Sudanese than I do cybersecurity. So I am definitely not the person that um, I would uh, select uh, or raise my hands if I was assigned a topic like cybersecurity. And whenever we got those type of specific requests, we would uh, canvas to identify people who had that kind of dual expertise. Um, we've had people in the Bureau that um, came from so many different backgrounds, you know, doctors, engineers, um, different areas of expertise. So to the extent possible, and as a program manager, it was my responsibility to make sure I know if Angie has, you know, Arabic language skills and also um, she has self-identified or has confirmed to us that she is an expert in cybersecurity, I need to have a database or some way to know that whenever I get that kind of specific uh, request, I will tap Angie to help. Because if you don't, then you're falling into that really uh, challenging situation where you have Nazareth who speaks really good Sudanese Arabic, but does not you know cybersecurity. And that's not, um, the finished product would not be the polished uh, intelligence product that it should be. So even though um, 
even though you might not think that something as cybersecurity or something even less important in your mind would be a good thing to have, I would highly encourage you to uh, state that and not discount it as an extra skill set that not only helps you get your foot in the door, but then when you are in the intelligence community at any given agency and you submit your promotion um, criteria by being able to do more than what others have, you can you know, provide a narrative that says, um, I've supported an assignment in Iraq and whatever, you know, I'm just making this stuff up. Um, and you demonstrate that you know, the customer said that you did a really good job in a very unique um, area that is different than, you know, not to say that Nazareth who speaks Nazareth uh, Sudanese is not good, but you know, in you've differentiated yourself from others who are providing similar support. And now I would like to stop speaking and let Angie speak because I'm sure she has really a lot of information to share with us. So I think we've pretty much covered how big of a priority that topic is, um, but I did want to just flag that, yes, there are lots and lots of opportunities for people that have that expertise. And a lot of the time, it's okay that the expertise in that is initially um, in English, and then you're able to use your developing language skills to you know, make that shift. Um, a lot of the time when we're training for things like that, we are going to make use of material that is English to get people up to speed. And so, yes, but it's a huge priority for the community. Thank you, everyone. Actually, we, you know, just a comment as well on that question from the cyber perspective. You know, intelligence uh, analysts look outside the network, cybersecurity professionals look inside the network and the code and all those things. And, and what we find, you know, there's plenty of case studies where you can see where understanding of Cyrillic or other languages has led to the indication of hacking from countries around the world. Uh, one perfect example is the DNC hack, which was from traced back to Russian hackers because of a typographical error in Cyrillic. And uh, that understanding is from that uh, language perspective. So it definitely is a lot of overlap. But uh, we're, we'd like to go to the next question from Renee Guardiola. Um, the question is about learning. Specifically, you know, finds he finds that the language, um, you know, learning in a classroom is not optimal. And so is asking for what tools and methodologies that you use to learn and also maintain your language skills, or if there's a language service that, you know, you preference, but specifically, you know, what tools and methodologies do you use? Mm. Okay, I'll, I'll quickly comment, but I, I <clears throat> will, I think there's some great uh, input from the panel members as well. Uh, I think uh, I would say that uh, everybody learns differently, has different kind of learning styles. Some people learn better in a classroom setting. Some people um, feel that they can learn um, in teaching themselves. Uh, and so I think there's not one size fits all, um, but I think to me, what's the most critical factor uh, in, in, in learning is an individual's drive to learn a foreign language and, and to take the time um, to, to just get, um, you know, to keep working it, you know, day after day, hour after hour. Uh, the, the products that are out there um, are fine. Uh, I, I, I think they're all kind of do the same thing um, and, and they're, they're fine, but at some point, um, you know, you've got the fundamentals down. It's, it's getting out there on your own and, and, and kind of understanding uh, what your skills are, um, skill levels are in certain modalities and working on those, those skill levels. You might have to work on speaking skills. It's hard to speak you know, by yourself. So you're gonna need another individual there to kind of coach you through. Uh, same thing with writing and, 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 and listening and, and speaking. So, uh, so I'll, I'll stop there, um, panel. So I'd be happy to talk about training because I've, I've done quite a bit within the IC, but also as an adult learner of, um, of languages, it's, you know, it's obviously I can't fall back on chatting with family members necessarily to practice some of my skills. Um, I think, 
you know, we have tried, and especially the pandemic has really helped us try um, to have a lot more virtual options and for things to be both synchronous and asynchronous, but virtually, which does give people who might not be as comfortable speaking in a classroom um, right away or speaking off the cuff, it does give you that chance to sort of read through something or listen to something and process it and be able to, you know, work through it at your own pace. And I think that can be really important as you build your skills. Um, my colleague and I, for example, built a whole series of asynchronous videos for Arabic grammar that sort of hit on, on some of the high frequency challenges within the grammar so that people could watch it and learn from it at their own pace. Um, but I also think that one of the most important things for, especially for adult learners of foreign language, is getting some kind of feedback. It doesn't always have to be in person. It doesn't have to be in the classroom, but it is very easy to go through something and feel like you got it or you understood it all. And then as someone else picks it apart with you, you realize where you might've wanted to do something different or you might have you might not have realized some nuance or maybe that was more sarcastic than you thought or there's a better word there and so forth. So a lot of finding ways to get that feedback even if you're doing it through an asynchronous or an online program can be really important and really will push you ahead. Um, that in any, even if it's a virtual sort of immersion experience will really help you. The more you have to force yourself to use that language, think in that language and do activities, mundane activities in that language, the better you'll get. Nothing helped me learn Moroccan Arabic faster than realizing I did not have the right kind of towel when I arrived in Fez and mm -hmm. that I had to go straight to a market on very little sleep and figure out how to barter and work out getting a really basic item that would have very been nice. a piece of cake. <laughs> so yes, so you have those moments and you realize, oh my gosh, I really, I really have to take all my skills and use them. And it, it makes a big difference. Um, so I will, I'm not the best person to talk about the, how to, you know, acquire a language because I had the um, kind of luxury of living in a household uh, and in a country where we had three languages spoken, you know, at home and, and outside. But uh, one thing that I am really convinced of, and I think Don and, and, uh, and Angie and David would agree with me, is that the earlier you start, the better. So I'm of the opinion that um, we, as the intelligence community, need to work with you know elementary schools and middle schools, and before we get to high schools, in trying to um, get the populations that are trying to teach students a foreign language skill, because the earlier you start, the higher the um, chances of you acquiring that language. And absolutely agree with Angie in that immersion is the best way, when possible, to. Um, acquire a language in the beginning. One way in the Bureau, we try to help linguists um, continue to improve on our language skills uh, is we have a language quality review program where linguists, uh, once they come on board and you're expected to come with your foreign language skill because uh, you're tested before you come on board, you um, are Part of your work is uh, reviewed throughout the year to make sure that the product that you're uh, pushing out to Intel analysts and you know out within and outside the bureau is a product that has the correct information. So the language reviewers work with the linguists to make sure that you know the the uh, translation, be it from the foreign language into English or the other way around, is accurate, uh, doesn't lack the context, and um, <laughs> has all the nuances. So that I think is an important way for linguists, like Angie said, to make sure that they maintain their language skills and it doesn't atrophy because um, you are doing, you know, like audio work or maybe you're just doing one um, type of translation vice the next. It's not a direct answer, but um, it's something that, you know, I thought would be helpful to people, you know, as you think about what would happen once you come on board at um, a given agency. You're not going to be left and for yourself, you will be provided uh, the help that you need once you come on board. I hope that helps. Thank you, Nazareth. So what we're going to do is we're going to shift to another question. Um, this one is uh, specific with the, the type of proficiency. So Faith Kent asks, if one isn't native or otherwise fluent in a language, are there contexts where lower tiers of proficiency are still considered useful within the IC? 
<clears throat> uh, I'll, I'll start out and let the panel have their comments. Uh, yeah, it, it's um, it's nice um, for me to say that uh, you know that the the ideal you know candidate um, applying to the IC would have IRLR level three skills and all four uh, modalities in our most critical languages, um, and and I think it's an ideal we'll continue to strive for. Uh, but but in practice, um, it, it's uh, we have to um, be aware, uh, and it, and, it, and it's and it continues to to happen um, that uh, for some of our most critical languages, um, we may not get uh, candidates um, who have those skills. And again, I always will add the uh, you know the security clearance part as well. Someone is eligible to get a security clearance. So in in some cases. And I'm not saying in, in all cases, but for some of the more critical um, languages, um, you know, based on uh, an agency's uh, hiring targets and needs for a particular year, uh, they they may be willing um, to accept individuals, you know, with um, a lesser level of of language uh, expertise. Um, that that doesn't mean um, trained from scratch. Uh, it it means you know you've you've had some study and you have some proficiency. In, in a very, very critical language, you know, if it looks like you probably uh, will be clearable, um, then there will be some cases and some some agencies where they'd be willing to you know, take, um, you know, be, be flexible and bring you on uh, and train you up um, into the proficiency level that, that they need for you to execute the mission. Over. I just wanted to highlight that, especially within, um, within the Defense Department because there's such a wide range of opportunities and activities and mission sets that not having the through the roof language scores and that sort of near native uh, fluency, that doesn't mean that there aren't options where you couldn't use your language skill along with technical skills, for example, and be an incredible asset to your office. So, and you know, any of us, whether we've grown up speaking the language or we're adult learners, we're all kind of works in progress. So don't let the idea stop you that you might start in a role where you're not language professional first, you might be sort of in a more language enabled capacity, but you can use that time to take advantage of training opportunities that are there. Um, there is a lot of training going on throughout the IC, as well as you know external opportunities for additional training. So. Um, there are certainly are opportunities and there are definitely ways to leverage that language within different roles. Craig, if I can just quickly add, uh, going back to my experience that I mentioned about Tigrinya, um, Tigrinya is not my uh, native language, Arabic is, and I didn't think that I would be able to use it because my proficiency is not high, but the example that I highlighted where I was able to use my speaking proficiency to help interview um, the victim and used my cultural background to kind of augment that uh, language was helpful for us in the Bureau to, uh, you know, get the outcome hopefully that we desired. So even though I am native in Arabic, I was able to use another language that I was not um, very proficient in. So absolutely, just because you're not a native speaker or someone who doesn't have high proficiency in a language, doesn't mean that that will preclude you from being able to use that language later on, depending yeah. on, like Don said, the mission drives, uh, mission requirements drive what the agency needs. So we have a few more minutes, Nazareth, and uh, you know, speak, speaking to what you were just discussing, um, Ali Hoshki asks another question. He says, you know, are there um, specific things that you can do to improve your Arabic uh, fluency? And I think you mentioned the uh, the the influence of cultural understanding on, on improving proficiency or at least aptitude to understand other other lang other Arabic dialects. But can you speak to that? I would like to yield my time to Angie as somebody who has more experience in that area, especially um, who's who's actively using her language skill. From me, the one thing I will tell you is what the language testers tell me in different places is just keeping up with events, listening to place, uh, news like Al Jazeera, um, continuing to use my MSA, um, modern standard Arabic, because I don't use it often, um, getting uh, the, the language quality reviewers input to help me 
continue to improve my um, language skills and just continue to use it, be it yeah. in the practice with my colleagues or outside or home or listening to podcasts like uh, John said. But I think Angie probably has more uh, to share on that. Yeah, so and Angie, you can. And, and the question was, how do you maintain your fluency and how do you improve it? And especially, you know, we talked about military and national security uh, related uh, lexicon, you know, that it may not be um, a function of your of your home learning environment. You'd have to go somewhere else to learn those things. So how would you do that, uh, Angie? Right, so it's a big challenge because it, it does make you have to go out of your every day and out of your comfort zone. I know for some of the courses uh, I've developed where we were looking at very specific cultural issues, for example, with um, Islam and understanding references so that people had more of a shared cultural literacy, we had a lot of native speakers who just didn't grow up within the Muslim tradition. And it was a really amazing opportunity to see people who had extremely advanced language skills, but now having to work through challenging classical Arabic or, you know, online programs, for example, with a local sheikh talking about, you know, different aspects and quoting Quran and quoting Hadith and what have you. And it's not necessarily what they grew up with every day. Um, so pushing yourself to find topics that are outside of the everyday and to look at, oh wait, that's a totally different usage of that word than I've ever seen before. Or looking for podcasts that are on a very domain specific kind of vocabulary. Listening to news about like economics in particular, for example, will bring a lot of that. But the other thing I also wanted to mention that also kind of goes back to the training question is that within the IC, there are lots of informal learning groups as well as formal training. So you can get together with a group of adjunct instructors and your colleagues and your peers and all practice together. And you can find somebody that says, oh, wow, you know, so I'm really struggling to understand Libyan, for example, or, hey, you know, I have, you know, I have a really hard time understanding, you know, Syrian or Lebanese. You can bring those people together for an informal, but still, you know, accredited session to work through those things just the way you could in a university setting. I mean, when I was in grad school and we were studying um, classical Arabic, we had a little study group where we worked through these things at great length. And those networks totally exist within the IC and are a really great way to practice with people that you might not have encountered in your everyday life, but that you now have the opportunity to work with over. That's fantastic. Uh, we're actually gonna end at this moment in time. Um, and I want to wrap it up by just saying thank you so much for our Director of National Intelligence colleagues and intelligence community partners. Uh, this has been fantastic and I'm glad for the cross-functional overview of how language uh, and people that have these language skills or even in, are interested in further their language capability and cultural awareness can, can find careers in the, in the security environment and corporate entities that, that have this mission set. So without further ado, uh, back over to uh, Don Gentile for the last word um, before we bring it back. And I was going to ask if, uh, if our department head wanted to discuss anything or provide some last comments, but back over to Don Gentile <clears throat> for those comments. Oh, um, thank you, Craig, for organizing this. It's been, uh, we're always very happy to, to talk to anybody who, who is interested in working for the IC using their foreign language skills. Again, uh, it, you know, where we, we, we need you. Uh, please uh, seriously consider uh, coming to work for us. Um, in the meantime, keep, keep working hard and developing your, your language skills. Over. Thank you for everything. Okay, and uh, one last plug here for the uh, University of Arizona's uh, ICCA Consortium. If you liked what you heard in this, in this broadcast, in this discussion with the panel members, and you want to get involved, uh, one of the best ways to do that is to be an active member of the Intelligence Community Centers for Academic Excellence um, Consortium or just the program itself here at the uh, University of Arizona.